because of the brochures yesterday. So it's a little bit um, it's a little bit faked up because this implies that I went right out into industry and spent the last year designing applications using Dark Spatial, and that's not really the case. But what I did do is decide to give you a run through of me and some of the things I've done that are GISE and Dark Spatially, and talk a little bit about everything. So. First of all, who am I? Well, the story starts, I'm going to start in college in Starkville, Mississippi. Uh, basically, I was getting my master's in physics at Mississippi State University. Now this is, for those of you who aren't familiar, this is the engineering college in Mississippi. And I was actually studying gamma radars. At this time in my life, I had not done anything with computers as far as beyond writing a very simple for loop or something. Uh, we were working with Visual Basic, or Quick Basic, in fact, to study some of the data that was coming from uh, the Burst and Transient Source Experiment, which are, it's not the whole satellite, it's just these four corners, there are eight corners on the satellite itself, collecting um, gamma ray burst data. Well, there was this big mystery involved because they had no idea what was causing these gamma ray bursts. And so, it enthralled me at the beginning of my graduate studies, and I got involved in it only to have 1998 come along where they set up an actual uh, experiment that took the data from this satellite, wired it down to the ground through the internet to other telescopes which could then capture an optical afterglow of the gamma ray burst for the first time and it more or less nullified all of the research that we had been doing. So <laughs> that means I, I had to change my topic and since my professor was tied in with NASA, we got involved with what was called the Mississippi Space Commission Initiative. This was funding for individuals to work with NASA data, satellite images, and all this kind of stuff. Um, but they were having trouble getting that satellite imagery out into the general public. They were having trouble getting money to do further research, and they wanted to really coordinate those two because they'd been uh, a government shop for so long that nobody had really said, let's come down and build some practical applications for these, uh, you know, reams and reams of satellite images that we have. So, what we decided uh, was we worked with one of our local commercial guys. So they, they took their commercial entity, tied it to me, a researcher at a university. And the problem he came up with was, hey, there's a lot of old maps that we have. Not all of these old maps agree with one another. Sometimes their scale is slightly off, or they, they, maybe one road is not matching up with the other road, but which one do you correct? Do you then scale with the one on the left, do you scale with the one on the right? So they came up with this idea, well, if we use satellite images as the truth, we can modify the old maps. Well, that's fine if you're doing this by hand. The only problem is there's lots and lots and lots of maps. <laughs> and so, do we really want to go through by hand and modify the, the, the shapes for every single case? And the answer is if we could automate this, then that would work much better. So that was what my first dissertation was in, in my master's degree, was designing an automated tool that would go through, find the intersections and roads, match them up with the intersections in the slightly distorted maps, and then adjust the maps so that they would coordinating the satellite and Today it's almost sort of an afterthought for things that had to happen. But um, that's that's sort of where I got involved in GIS for the first time. And you know they even took me into an ArcGIS 3.2 training course, which was sort of ridiculous because we didn't have ArcGIS 3.2, but they were training me anyway because they thought that, that would be appropriate. Um, but anyway, so we learned some interesting things, and I kind of, I found a little bit of the bug at that time. So then we're going to skip forward in my, my history a little bit. Those of you who know me have been regaled with the Orange Juice Factory Tales uh, of about two years after I got that degree, and it was hard times finding work, it was not really good. Really cool. But uh, eventually I ended up in Tallahassee for it. Now, at that time, I was working with a company uh, called MacTech. So, MacTech was uh, essentially a company that was involved in petroleum cleanup. Now, they're involved in other things. They're an engineering consulting group, so they're involved in other things all over the U.S., but in Tallahassee, Florida, they're 
principle operating uh, concern is essentially spills and how close those spills are to, to water sources. And so that's actually a very GIS-oriented question. And a lot of the cleanup money that's associated with those projects is tied to justifying your use of the money. So in other words, you have an oil spill, for sure. Is it close to a school? Is it close to a drinking water well? Is it close to a natural environment that's going to be affected by this? Or is it kind of out in the middle of nowhere and not really bugging anything? So they score the uh, cleanup sites based on the proximity. Well, that's, if you had a GIS tool that can give you that heads up beforehand, you can position yourself to be marketing to the right people just before they're told by the government, hey, we're going to fund your cleanup activity. You need to pick somebody. So if you can get there first and predict who's going to be next on that list, then you get the, uh, you're, you're more likely to get the job. So it was a, a marketing venture that got involved again. Um, but again, we didn't really want everybody to have to have our GIS on their desktop in order to accomplish that. So I began looking around. I was going to, even it was so simple, the application that we were talking about was so simple, I was going to consider writing it from scratch, but I thought, Maybe this is something that if somebody else has already done, maybe there's something free, maybe I just need a map control, something that will prevent me from having to reinvent the wheel in that part of it. And I discovered almost right away on Google, that window has the Apex control now. At that point, I was a little bit more of a developer because I remember that project that I had done in satellite working. I actually did that in DB6. And at this stage, I was it, time had passed, so now we were up to VBNet. And so I was getting involved with this, and I said, well, I can take this ActiveX map, put it into my project, and very rapidly, I had a working uh, application. So most of you are familiar with the idea that with regular GIS, if you have a bunch of users in your company that just want to do some single action very repetitively, doping them into an environment with a regular GIS is very confusing and can cost a fortune and it's just not really uh, a doable thing. Whereas if you have a, a custom GIS application, you can basically design exactly what you want it to do. And uh, in this case, using that Windows tools, it was actually uh, free. So that was a big benefit for, for my consideration of using that. Now, the reality is free is always debated. Um, there are hidden costs with any kind of open source activity. Uh, what I ended up doing was asking questions on the forum at some stage in my learning how to use the app and software. And I think that forums are especially important um, because they allow us to, as, as the user, allow us to ask exactly the question we want to answer. And at the same time, from a support standpoint, it allows you to answer questions that actually will help individuals. So that was really critical. And the really important aspect of forums is the ability to have a cascade. So one person helps two people, and those two people help four people, and then those four people help eight people. It's the only thing I've seen that could ever hope to keep up with an exponential increase in the number of downloaders, number of users, and so on. Um, and so that's really great, and we need to foster that. Um, so then, one thing led to another, Dan got me involved in the project at a little bit at, in a bit deeper level, because here I am communicating on the forum all the time, and he offered to have me come up to do a master's. I already had one, but if he was going to bring a PhD, I had to talk about that. So here we have, this is just beautiful light of the world. It's scenic and picturesque, at least for the summer. And then it's, uh, and, and, and it was not a bad experience. It was really nice, um, kind of out of the way. Um, and up there they decided that engineering and hydrology were basically anything that considers uh, the very important critical resource of water was really worth putting funding into. Uh, all throughout the West, and California and, and Nevada, and all of these states have a lot of trouble with water. So, 
there's big money in learning how to solve those water problems. And so part of that starts with taking natural terrain and delineating watersheds and modeling what's going to happen with that runoff and pollution sources and so on. So as we started getting involved in this, as I got pulled into the GIS world, I was there to play with the map tools, basically. But, but basically, I got sucked into engineering hydrology as an additional concern. And so most of my coursework at, at the school was focused on this engineering background. Even though most of my time doing research was all about developing software. Uh, the first thing they had me look at was a problem that was uh, involving pit filling. Those of you who are into hydrology you know about it. Those of you who are not, uh, the idea is you're trying to figure out which way water is going to run. If you're using the idea that water flows downhill and you hit a pit, well, now you've got arrows pointing, you know, all towards the same spot, and it's not going anywhere. So that doesn't accurately answer the question of where's the water going to end up. So the way they solve that is they run through an algorithm and fill in the pit so that it's uh, a little bit flat. And what that enables the water to do is just run right across the pit and, and continue to get that plug. Uh, so why are we building it? I mean, in essence, if we can uh, model the, the water without doing any of this building, the, the reality is when you're talking about automatic watershed delineation, it's easier to run a simple algorithm than a one-time build. And, uh, and once you've filled those pits once, you can then reuse that modified terrain multiple times. So that's why a lot of these are split out into separate processes or modules that you can use independently. Um, so the big problem was our version was very slow. Matt Window had a pit filling that took, you know, for a, a grid that would take ArcGIS six minutes, ours was taking like 50. And there was no real explanation for that given to me, but they were working with uh, an algorithm that was designed by a hydrologist. So they're probably, they didn't come at it from the approach of a computer scientist. Um, by the end of that exper experience, we had come up with something that was a lot faster. So. By the end of it, the ArcGIS time was way up there in, in, in much, maybe 20 times as long to compute as what we had. So it was a huge jump from them having a, a massive edge on us to us having a massive edge on them, which was great. So that was like the first year of what I did. Uh, because even though it took two weeks to come with, with an algorithm that was faster than ArcGIS, it then takes you six months to develop and to actually do research to find out everybody else's algorithm, implement their algorithms compared to your algorithm, and create a paper, then coming up with uh, other mod modifications that make it scalable to where you can do it on massive images, do it in pieces, and then put together those pieces at the end. Um, but anyway, long story short, after that year, we sort of moved on to this notion of dot spectrum. And what we were trying for at the time, I was working on a, a part of the Map Window Tools kit, which was the Map Window GeoProp library. All it was responsible for was doing things like overlay calculations, intersection calculations, stuff like that. I was getting involved with uh, the, the net topology suite in order to answer some of those questions. At about the same time, we had a former graduate student named Chris Michaelis who was developing a, a pure .NET version of Mountain Window. And that was the whole goal, was it would not use ActiveX registration. That was the main thing that we were trying to get away from. So when he graduated, that left this sort of gap in, in, in concepts. And so I tried to put the two concepts together. I said, why not take the uh, net topology suite kind of model, the OGC geometries and so on, and build it right in as part of a framework to build the GIS on top of that. 